the blessings of God in the house of the Lord once more. There's not a better place other other than with Jesus Christ to be than with other believers. Amen. Amen. We're going to go to God in prayer this morning, then we're going to start our lesson for today. Dear God, our Father, we thank you once more that you've shown yourself awesome again. We thank you for allowing us to gather once more to hear what you have to say to our lives. And we pray now that you would open our hearts, our ears, and our will to do that we will be all that you've called for us to be. We pray that you would take what you've given us this day, that you would produce much fruit in our life as a result of this time we spend with you. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and thank God. Amen, amen. Once again, we want to share these lessons with you that you would grow closer to God and be more of what God would want you to be. You know, I could almost say ditto. A lot of the stuff that Pastor Skinner said this morning <laughs> is in my lesson for Sunday school this morning. Uh, our lesson this morning is going to come from James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. I know we're living at a time where things are strange and becoming strained. Uh, we're at home a lot people we've never spent this much time with before in our lives. Uh, And I know what can happen from time to time. Because we are individuals, we all have our own opinions and our own desires. And there are a lot of times that our opinion and our desires causes us to have disagreements. This morning in our lesson, James is going to share with us how to avoid family disagreements. The subject of our lesson this morning is genuine wisdom in family disagreements. Uh, James is our writer, and he writes uh, to the church of Israelites. Let me explain that. He writes to Christian Jews that are scattered throughout all the world. Pastor Skinner explained to us this morning how they were scattered as a result of the Syrians and the Babylonians. And now that the Holy Spirit has come and they begin to proclaim Jesus Christ, they can no longer stay together. But because of evil influences, they are scattered all over the world. So James now is writing to those that have been scattered all over the world. But he he gives them first in the book of James, he says there has to be genuine religion. He said your religion has to be genuine. He says you cannot say that you believe in God, say that you love God, and not do things that prove that you love God. He says also, he says, there has to be genuine faith. He says, just like the faith that Abraham had. He says, we have to have that same genuine faith. And not only do we believe, believe that, not only do we say that we believe God, but we do what we do because we believe God is going to do what he said he would do. And then when we get to chapter 3, verse 13, he begins to break down genuine wisdom. Genuine wisdom. And wisdom is knowing and applying what you know. So this is what he says in, uh, uh, according to James chapter uh, <clears throat> 4, verse 1. He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. James chapter 4, verse 2. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version this morning. Uh, James sets us up with these things to avoid avoid in in disagreements. He sets us up in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 18, he says, The seed whose fruit is righteousness is sound in peace by those who make 
peace. He says, listen, righteousness is sown if you are striving to make peace. So he says now, if we're going to have genuine wisdom in family disagreements, the first thing he says, he says, genuine wisdom checks the personal motive of disagreements in the family. Let me, let me say that again so you can write it down. Genuine wisdom checks the personal motive of disagreements in the family. Why do disagreements rise in the family? Look what James says. He says the first reason that disagreements arise in families is because selfishness creates a struggle in you and motivates disagreements in the family. Look at verse 1. He says, what is the source of, of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Listen, James is not coming up with this idea on his own. He's referring back to Paul. Paul says in, in, in Romans, he says, what I would do, I cannot do, and that what I don't want to do, that's what I do because there's a war going on in my members. Listen what James is saying. He's saying, listen, the reason you have a disagreement in your house, it ain't because of the other person, it's because of the stuff that's going on in you. He says, first thing going on in you is selfishness. You want to have your way. selfishness. You want to do what you want to do and you don't care what nobody else want to do. You want to have what you want to have and you don't care what anybody else in the house want to have. You are selfish and when you become selfish it gives birth, it motivates disagreement in the family. It's the struggle in you. Ain't nothing wrong with everybody else. You got to check you. And it has to be a personal check. You can't do Listen, too many times we go around this and we want to say what's wrong with everybody else, but we never examine ourselves. James says you have to examine yourself. He says, uh, is not the source of your pleasures that wages war in your members? There are some things you just want just to satisfy you. He says not only is selfishness, creates a struggle in you and motivates disagreements in the family. But he said, longing desires in you motivates disagreements in the family. He says, you lust and do not have. You, you desire, you lust, you, you have a longing desire for things, but you just can't grasp it. He says, these are the things that are motivating you to disagreements. He says, uh, you commit murder, so you commit murder. Now listen, he say, he said, you desire so much to have your way that you will even result to killing those who are in your family. Listen, yeah, we ain't pulling no gun. I, don't, I hope we're not pulling no guns out. I hope we're not going to the kitchen and getting no butcher knives and stabbing one another. But one thing we are doing, we are killing each other because we are not encouraging each other. We are not uh, looking out for the best interests of each other. When you are selfish and you want to satisfy your desires and you will do whatever it takes to satisfy those desires, you actually commit murder. You put to death, he says, those in your family. Longing desires. He says you commit murder. Uh, you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. He said jealousy of a person or eagerness to possess something in you motivates disagreements in the family. Jealousy of a... I know somebody said, well, I'm not jealous of my, my wife and my kids. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. He says jealousy in a person or eagerness to possess something. Listen, if you always want to have your way and you refuse to let them have their way, he says jealousy 
And, and he says, uh, man, envious. And it, it, it's a sad thing when you cannot, when you are jealous and envious of someone that God has given you the responsibility for. Listen, God, it, it ain't by chance we have the families we have. It is by God's ultimate design that we are connected as we are. And if you are practicing jealousy and envy over someone God has placed in your life, it is a shame on you, not on them. When you want to have your way, what is, what, how does jealousy happen in the house? When, when you're when you mad because they want to watch good times all the time. Oh, are you upset because they eat the thigh and not the drumstick? See, that's some simple stuff, huh? But that's what Satan uses. He uses, listen, we, we're at home. I know a lot of y'all got cabin fever now, and y'all want to get out. But, but it's, it, listen, it, it, it might not be the best thing to get out right now. But while you're at home, you got to put in check your jealousy. I don't. He says, you're envious and, and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You can't have your way, so you pick fights. Ain't nothing wrong with them. It's all happening in you. And you can't have your way. You're jealous of how they're, they're listen. There are some of us are just, just cool and calm staying at home. We good with it. I hope they don't call me back to work. Because I'm good with being at home. But some of us are just so anxious and jealous and saying, why are you not excited about going somewhere? You need to be ready to get out of here. And because we're jealous and envious of those people going to Galveston. <laughs> there was a traffic jam in Galveston yesterday, y'all. I don't understand it. He's, but he said, because, because we're, James said, because we're envious and jealous and we cannot obtain, we cannot grasp what we desire. We can't get our desires achieved. He said, we pick fights. We start arguing. And we, we argue about the smallest thing. You didn't put the toilet paper on the road right. Yeah. People are dying every day by the hundreds. And you worried about the toilet paper. Why you left your cup out? You could have put your cup in the sink. You pick fights. And it ain't got nothing to do with what that person has done. It's all about what's going on inside of you. He says, you do not have because you ask not. The reason you can't, you're not having your way is because you're just not asking. Verse 3. James chapter 4, verse 3, he says, You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. He says, wickedness. Now, look, look, a lot of times we hear, we hear this, this text and, and we, we, we simplify it. And we say, you have not because you ask not. That's what we say. We just say, the reason you don't have what you want is because you don't ask for it. But no, what James actually says, he says, wickedness is in your motives for disagreement in the family. He says, you ask not and you receive not because you ask with wrong motives. Now, that wrong motives, that, that, it's wickedness. It's what causes you not to have when you ask 
of God. Because look what, look what verse John 3 and 22 says. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Because he keep his commandments. Because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Listen to what, what John said. He says, if you ask anything of the Lord and you've been keeping his commandments, he will give you what you ask for. But a lot of times we're asking God for things, but it's based out of a wicked motive. Not that we would bring glory to God, but that we would satisfy ourselves. He said, "Wicked, genuine wisdom checks the personal motive of disagreements in the family. So last time you had, uh, uh, the next time, uh, the last time, the next time you have an argument, check and see what your motives is for that argument. Because I, I almost guarantee that the source is going to be selfishness, long desi longing desires or lust, jealousy, or just wickedness. Next thing James tells us, he says, uh, genuine wisdom comprehends the personal management responsibilities of disagreements in the family. Genuine wisdom comprehends the personal management responsibilities of disagreements in the family. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we have the responsibility to manage our family disagreements. We cannot just disagree and let it go. We have the personal responsibility to manage our disagreements in our families. It, it ain't the daddy's responsibility. It ain't just the mama's responsibility. It ain't just the kid's responsibility. Each one of us in the house have the personal responsibility to manage them disagreements. Look what he look what look what James says. Verse four, he says, "You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the Lord is hostility between toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God." Each believer has the responsibility of managing a monogamy relationship with God. Look what he says. He, he uses the, the example of a marriage. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? He's saying you cheaters on God. You've been laying around with some other God, when you've declared that God, Jehovah, Yahweh is your God, but you've been substituting God for your own selfish desires. He said, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Listen, if you have more worldly views than godly views, guess what? You are an enemy with God. If everything in your house is based on how the world is ran, guess what? You are an enemy with God. If God is not having the say in your relationships and your home, you are an enemy That is. You are in a, listen, a monogamous relationship with God. Listen to what God tells the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. He says, I am the Lord, your God. You shall have no other God besides me. He says, we are in a relationship together and no one else should take my place in your life. If you choose not to obey God, 
you've chosen to break the marriage vow you have with him based on his promises for you. And you got to manage that. Because I learned something while ago. I'm 57 now. I'm 57, yeah. I'm 57 now. And uh, I've learned something about, about God. He don't make you love him. He don't make you obey him. He gives you the choice to do it. And if you're in a serious relationship with him, the choices you're going to make is going to be that which is pleasing to God. Listen, I've been at home. Let's see. This has been going on for what, five, six weeks now? Of those five or six weeks, my wife has been home every day. Uh, this week, I worked four hours. So this week, we've been home. But I ain't talking to nobody else but her. Because I'm in a relationship with just her. Just been me and Karen. And I got to watch myself. Because I forget sometimes she's the weaker vessel. And I want to have my way, but I got to catch myself because I'm in a relationship just with her. And I want to keep her happy. So I've been painting rooms. I've been doing some plumbing work. I've been doing all kind of stuff she want to do because I'm in a relationship with her. And what she requests of me, I do it to make her happy or to please her. Listen, we're in a relationship with God. And he wants us to do some repairs on us that we would be pleasing to him. And we got to be busy about doing it. Pastor said this morning, some of, us, some of us take God just so lightly. <laughs> just, things, are, things are going on that we've never seen before, and we're still treating God like we were treating him before it started happening. That is amazing. That in all that's going on, we still don't see the magnificent power of our God. The whole world. And in spite of it attacking the whole world, it has not attacked me. It's only by the grace of God. And listen, I have the responsibility of managing that relationship with God. I got to make sure he's the most important thing in my life. I have to do it. I can't wait for Pastor Skinner to do it for me. I have to do it personally. I got to manage that. I got to make sure that he's always first. I said I was going to teach 15 minutes. But that's gone. All right. Each believer has, not only is each believer has a responsibility of managing a monogamy relationship with God, each believer has a responsibility of managing a monumental investment from God. Look at verse 5 and verse 6. He says, or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Listen, what, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 6 and 19, Paul says, do you know that we are not, uh, do you not know that we are the temple of God? And he dwells in us. He has caused his spirit to live in us. Listen, if you have put your faith, your trust, and your confidence in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has placed his spirit in us. What a monumental investment 
God has made in us. He put the spirit of himself in us. What an investment, huh? But the problem is, though he put the spirit of God in us, he did not take the spirit of the flesh out of us. We still have that old man in us. And what's going on now? That old man is jealous of the Spirit of God living in us. He wants to have his way. We have the responsibility of protecting the investment God has made in us. How do you protect that, preacher? James, how am I supposed to protect that? Look at verse, verse 6 says, but he gives, greater, gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Go, listen, the more humble you are, the more grace you, you experience. If you manage who's controlling your life, you will acknowledge the greater grace that you have on your life. Each believer has the responsibility of managing continual approach to God. This is, now, this is how we manage that monumental investment. is that we have to be continually approaching God. You cannot protect his investment unless you are nurturing his investment by getting closer to him. He says in verse 7, he says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Each believer has a responsibility of managing continual approach to God. Now, the verbs that, that James uses in this, it, 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 is, a, it is of the aorist <laughs> tense. <laughs> See, I told y'all I could have said ditto, <laughs> everything he was saying. It's of the aorist tense. And what that means is that it's not just happening right now. It's a continuous and ongoing thing. Listen, some of us, are messed up because we can't come to 7818 born air. What, listen what James is saying. He's saying you ought to be in a continual approach to God. You coming here does not get you any closer to God, but the more time you spend with him personally gets you closer to him. Because you know what? We, 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 we read verse 7 and we just leave out the first clause, but we jump on. The second clause, resist the devil and he will flee. You remember the two guys in Acts that were preaching and they came up on those demons and them demons said, Jesus, we know, Paul, we know, but who in the world are you? And the demons jumped on them and beat them up. That's what's going on with a lot of believers. They're declaring resist. They're trying to resist the devil on their own, but they don't have the Holy Spirit that's guiding and guarding and leading you. And the devil just beating you up. But now, if you want, if you want to manage the investment that God has made in you, you got to continually approach God. Verse eight says, "Draw near to God." And he will draw near to you. First thing James says, if you're going to draw near to God, this is what you got to do. You got to yield to God's authority and will. Commit your life to him and his control and be willing to follow him. 
Submit therefore to God. I'm going to say it again because a lot of us ain't got that yet. He says you got to yield to God's authority and will. Commit your life to him and his control and be willing to follow him. You got to yield, commit, and follow. That's how you draw near to God. Not only does James say you got to uh, submit that for the God. You know, we got a problem. Let, let me stop right here. This, really, this is the part I really wanted to dwell on for a while. Because we got a problem with submission. We got a problem with submission. And I think this pandemic has proven it. Because our government has told us to stay home. And we wouldn't stay home. Lena Hidalgo has told us that it is mandatory that you wear mask in Harris County and we refuse to submit and wear mask. I got my I got my But we refuse to do it. Because we have a problem with submitting. Listen, you're not going to get any closer to God. You're not going to know more about God. You're not going to experience all God has for you unless you yield to his authority and his will. Commit your life to him and his control and be willing to follow him. Look what James says now. Num number two thing in, in drawing near to God. He says, do not allow Satan to entice and tempt you. Look what he says. Uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But you know what? You can't do part two if you're not doing number one. He says, submit that for the God. Once you are letting God lead you, guide you, and direct your life, then you can resist the devil, and then he flees. If you don't submit, he ain't going nowhere. We don't have the capability within ourselves to resist the devil. If Eve couldn't do it when all she knew was what God has said, how do you expect us to do it? When we know so much more than Eve knew. But you can't resist the devil unless you yield to God's authority. He says, do not allow Satan to entice and tempt you. Listen, it, 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 you can say resist all you want, but if you're not doing something opposite of what Satan is tempting you with, you'll never resist. You got to be doing what God says in order to resist the temptations of Satan. We're going now, things are getting semi back to normal. We've been locked up in the house with our wives and our husbands for a while now. When you get out in the public, and you see somebody that looks better than your wife or your husband been looking in the last 30, 40 days. You're not going, because y'all know Satan is still doing the same old tricks. You're not going to resist unless you've already committed to God. There's some single folk out there have been lonely. 30 or 40 days, yeah. you've been forced to practice celibacy yeah. because you can't be with nobody and nobody can't be with you. But now that things are relaxing a little bit, if you don't follow God's control, 
All right. So you can't, can't you, you cannot allow Satan to entice and tempt you. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He says, replace your desire, your desire to sin with your desire to experience God's purity. Replace your desire to sin with your desire to experience God's purity. He says, listen, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. You sinners, you double-minded. He says, replace your desire to sin because by nature we have the desire to sin. But he says, replace your desire to sin with your desire to experience God's purity. We, God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. He says, it, it's not a suggestion. It is an expectation and a command. So he said, if you really want to experience God's purity, you got to replace your desire to sin with your desire to experience God's purity. Do you really want to know what it's like to really be holy? To really e experience God and his purity? You have the responsibility to continually be trying to manage that experience of God's purity. He says, do not be afraid to express deep heartfelt sorrow in your sins. Look at verse uh, 9. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your glory to gloom. You know, in the society we live in, people rejoice in sin. If you just look at YouTube, you look at Facebook, Instagram, and all them other grams they got, there's more rejoicing in sin than there is in righteousness. And people are not sorry when they get caught in sin. Y'all know what we do? We use the excuse. You know, a mind is, is willing, but the flesh is weak. When I try to do right, evil is present on every hand. We've turned scripture into excuses. But he says, do not be afraid to express deep heartfelt sorrow for you. When you Disobey God. If you are drawing near to him, it ought to make you feel bad. It ought to cause you to cry. You know that feeling when you lose a loved one? That sadness? And that seemed like a loss of hope, that grief you have when you lose a loved one. He says, when you sin against God, that's the same feeling that should come over you when you are drawing near to him. The problem is we're not drawing near to him, so it don't bother us. He said, don't be afraid to express, you know, we live in a, a world where they say men shouldn't cry. I have my grandson, he, he's a crybaby. I wonder where he got it from. He cries for everything. You talk to him a little too hard, he's giving you the face. And, and we have a bad habit of telling him when he's done something wrong, don't cry. When we ought to be allowing him to feel the sorrow. Oh, oh, 
We ought to allow him to feel bad about disobeying us. But we want to hurry up and cheer him up. When we are drawing near to God, we ought to find ourselves in sorrow when we sin against God. And listen, don't be afraid to express that sorrow. You side around the house and they ask you, what's wrong with you? Go on, tell them what's wrong with I messed up. Listen, and we're talking about disagreements in the family. There are some times when we wrong and we cause the disagreement. And when we realize we've caused the disagreement, instead of us, Saying I'm sorry and showing I'm sorry. You know what we do? We bow up. I ain't going to show my weakness. I'm in control in here. But we ought to show sorrow and let those who we have the disagreement with know we're sorry. In our families, too many times we just let things go. And we chalk it up to that's how they is. You know them. They've been that way all their life. But if you're drawing near to God, you cannot stay the way you've been. There has to be a change that takes place. And when you do cause a disagreement in the house, you need to have godly sorrow. And don't be, don't be ashamed to show up. Cry and say, yeah, I'm sorry. I messed up. I messed up. Please forgive me. It's all my fault. I want it my way. Admit it. it. But if you're drawing near to God, these are the things that you do. He says, then you're going to. Uh, verse, verse 10. He says, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. You need to recognize that our word comes from God alone. Humble yourselves in the presence of God, in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. We need to realize, recognize, come to grips with that our word comes from God alone. God puts the value on who you are. And if you submit to him, if you humble yourself unto him, if you want to be somebody, he's going to raise you up. But it's not going to be based on your selfish desires. It's going to be based on your obedience to him. He, he's going to lift you up. He, people, people are going to notice you're different. They're going to notice your righteous ways. And they will change their ways based on your righteous ways. But you got to humble yourselves under God. My last thing is uh, genuine wisdom considers the value of life before, during, and after disagreements in the family. Let me say that one more time so you can write it down. Genuine wisdom considers the value of life before, during, and after disagreements in the family. Look at verse 11. He says, do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you who judge your neighbor? We got to value the relationship of the brethren, first of all. We got to value the relationship of the brethren. He says, do not speak against one another. Brethren, he said, don't, don't, don't be bad-mouthing each other. 
Don't be gossiping on, on each other. I know it's just us. It's mama, daddy, and the children at home. Don't be going to tell the children. Look, you see how daddy acting? You see what mama doing? Well, them children show sure are bad. I don't know how them teachers dealt with them children. But they something else. He says, do not speak against one another, brethren. And then that brethren is key. Because what he's doing, he's, he's connecting us all through the body of Jesus Christ. That we've been bought with a price. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died not just for me and you, but for all that believe in him. So he says, do not speak against one another, brethren. If Jesus has died for you, you are no more important than me. And I ain't no more important than you. I know that was bad English. But I'm not any more important than you are. So we don't have the right or the audacity to speak against one another. Listen to what what Moses writes in Genesis. He says, For the Lord God formed man of the dust, and he made him in his image. That didn't click with you? That God has made every human in his his image. Whether black, yellow, brown, or green, you're in his image. And we have the audacity to talk bad about somebody that God made like him. So really, really, when you speak against your brother, you really speaking against God. Regardless of who they are, who they are. They're in his image and in his likeness. So he, James tells us, he says, do not speak against one another. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. Listen now, well, James earlier in, in chapter 1, he says, you have to look into the, the law of love. And what that law of love is, says you love the Lord God with all your heart, body, and spirit, and then you love your neighbor. When you declare yourself as judge, you now say, I have the right to love who I want. When God has demand, uh, commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves, we now take ourselves out of the place of his image and his likeness and make ourselves equal with him when we begin to judge our brothers. We sit on the throne with God and make a declaration about our brothers and our sisters based on our personal preference when God has said, you shouldn't. We no longer be we, know, we, we take ourselves out of being his image and his likeness and make ourselves God. That's what James says. He says, but if you judge, but if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one law lawgiver and judge. Listen, we're all equal. And God said, we all equal. We're the same. Ain't no big eyes and little use. 
Ain't no I in team. T, capital T, capital E, capital A, capital N. We're all the same. There's only one lawgiver and judge. The one, now this, this is key. The one who is able to save and to destroy. Listen, we don't have the capability of saving anyone or destroying anyone. Listen, what, what, what Jesus says, fear, fear, don't, don't fear the ones that can kill the, the body. But he said, fear the ones who kill both body and, and soul. Yeah, in hell is what he says. So, you know, when, when, we, when, we, when we place ourselves as judge, we're acting like we can send someone to hell when there's only one. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Look at that man. What, what qualifies you to judge someone else? All of us are unemployed right now almost. So it can't be your job. That don't qualify you to judge someone else, does it? All of us are scared as heck of the corona, coronavirus. <laughs> So that don't give you the right to, to judge. <laughs> so who are you? And what qualifies you to be a judge? Verse, verse, verse 13, he says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. We have to value the will of God above your plans and goals. I think God has put a shutdown on some of our plans and goals here lately. It's because we don't value his will above our plans and our goals. We, we have the plan to be in such and such place financially by the end of this year. But guess what? God didn't put a, a, a wrench in that plan. He says, come now. You who say, you know, it's, and it's all right to plan. And you should have goals. But the qualifier to your plans and your goals should be if it is the Lord's will. That's the qualifier for your plans and your goals. If the Lord will allow it to happen, this is what I'm going to do. But it is sad that a lot of our disagreements in our house rises because we do not consider what the Lord's will is for our house. We buy cars and don't consult the Lord. And we ain't got no money to buy groceries now because we got to pay that car note. When we should have consulted the Lord's will. He says, don't, don't you know that your life, and we ought to really get that now, that our life is just a vapor. There are some people we saw before the pandemic that we will never see again. Because life is like a vapor. Here now 
And the wind blows, takes it away. And we have the audacity to try to leave God out of our plans, leave him out of our goals, and no, and not understanding that he holds life in his hand. And he determines who lives, who dies, and everything else that happens in this world. He determines. Man, uh, the pastor hit it on it this morning. Y'all know what? We couldn't have made it through this with any other president other than Donald, than Donald J. Trump. We wouldn't have made it. God designed him to be the president of the United States at this time. That was his will. Whether you like it or not, that's his will. And if he got four more years to go, guess what? That's his will. You can plan to go vote if you want, but if God has already decided, all right. But we need to value God's will. Value his will. The last thing we need to value the knowledge and obedience to what is good. Instead, you ought to say, verse 15 of, uh, verse 16 of, 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 verse, of James chapter 4, verse 16. But as it is, uh, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Value the knowledge and obedience of what is good. Listen, the reason we have disagreements in our family is because we do not value the knowledge of what we should do. A lot of us know how to squelch a lot of these arguments, but we make the choice not to do what is right. We're, we're busy looking at the sins we commit but we fail to look at the sins we omit. What, what does that mean, preacher? We busy doing, looking at what we've done, and we fail to look at what we have not done. There are some things that we know we should do to keep peace in our homes, but we choose to do the opposite. We just omit the truth. We know what God say about our situations. We understand what he say about our situation. But we make the selfish, jealous, lustful choice not to obey. And listen, it's not the fact that we just don't do it. It's just as bad if one of us starting a disagreement in our house and we know what the truth is and we don't say the truth. It's not bad that we know it and don't do it. There's a lot of things we know and we just keep our mouth shut. Oh, no. If I, wouldn't, if I would have said that, we would have never stopped arguing. I'm just trying to keep the peace. You ain't got no peace. Because you got wickedness and evilness going on in the house. Because you know the truth and you refuse to say the truth. It's not the peace of God. James says in, in chapter 3, verse 18, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Peace don't just happen. You got to work at it. Gracious Master, we thank you for this time we spent with you. We pray now that you were pleased with what is said and done in this place. We pray for those that are listening or viewing. We pray that you have your perfect will in their lives, Master. That they will become more of what you've desired for them to be. That they would draw nearer to you in their family disagreements. And 
order to solve what you've already solved. In order to create the unity you've already created. That we will sustain what you've already done. To bring you glory. To bring you honor. To bring you praise, Master. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. We have one announcement for our church family. There will be devotionals posted each Tuesday for our nursery children and youth to view. Participate in them with your parents. We led by our youth and children teachers. Amen. Till we see you later in the week. Have a good week.